I'm a fairly well-off young person. I have my own advertising agency that is doing well. So I don't need to build my own furniture out of wood that I found in the garbage. Salvage garden waste for firewood or assemble a zero dollar gaming setup. Which is the thing we're here to talk about. Because there's just something neat and full circle about finding a free TV and a free console to play on the TV and $500 worth of free games to play on it. So this is the setup. The TV is of course Old Bang Bang, a mighty b and CRT from circa 1995. I looked up the model number one so I could say it out loud in the video and give accurate specifications on the picture resolution and such, but I forgot everything that I read 5 seconds after reading it because I don't care about the specs or the name. It's a good looking TV and I don't need numbers to tell me that. The console is the fan favorite pink PS2, a console that I found in a block of ice at the dump. Amazingly, after a night in front of the fireplace and a good cleaning afterwards, it worked just fine and has worked fine ever since then. There were only about 50,000 of these made, which while sounding like a lot actually means that only 0.035% of PS2 come in this color, as the system sold 158 million units worldwide. The pink PS2 is actually exclusive to Europe, which means that 0.1% of European PS2s are pink, since the system sold 53 million units in that region. This one here is almost complete, it has two pink controllers, but is missing the pink memory card. If I was a collector, I would probably give a shit, but I'm not, so I don't. I do however care about the games for this thing. And oh man oh man does it have a great library. While I had a PS2 as a young lad, I only had about 10 games for it because we were more of an Xbox household. So there's something special for me personally about collecting for the system and getting a peek into other people's childhood and early adult memories. And because the system was cheap to develop for, a lot of games that I played and love on the Xbox actually have sequels or sidequels on the PS2, like the two-player co-op Hunter the Reckoning side story, Hunter the Reckoning Wayward. And some games like Half-Life 2 on the console had exclusive modes like a co-op mode that, while probably not being super great, is still neat for the one reason alone that it exists. I can't talk about every game I've found for free in great detail, even though I want to. So I've selected 5 games that I think for one reason or another are kind of neat, and 5 games that are the most expensive that I've found for free. And I will talk about these games in great detail and then list off all of the other ones that I have in my collection that I found at the dump in the end of the video. And finally I will of course also tell you their total worth. Okay, cool. Let's play some pink PlayStation. Let me take you back. Back to a time where developers could become popular making a certain type of game, and then they could take a break from that kind of game and make a new type of game. While that still occasionally happens, like with Creative Assembly taking a break from grand strategy games to make Alien Isolation, it is much more common that they go the way of Bioware and get bought up by a publisher who then forces them to make the same type of game over and over again, until most of the creative originals at the end that made the series special are gone, along with the original team members that came up with those creative ideas. I'm not gonna sit here and say that Shaolin Monks is a masterpiece that could never have been made today, because A, no publisher would ever greenlight this idea today, and B, it is no masterpiece. But it is interesting and legitimately unique. It's like if Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero wasn't a terrible game. The game opens up as you can see to a big, big, big fight scene, where it's hard to tell exactly who is on what side, because it kind of happens because the good guys interrupt a seemingly above board fighting tournament. I'm sure that they have their reasons, but they are not made clear at all in the intro cinematic. As the fighting ends with most of the good guys being left for dead, and our titular Shaolin monks jumping into a portal that leads to the faraway dimension of a basement in a similar looking castle to the one they're in, the game begins. What makes Mortal Kombat different from its mainline entry brothers and sisters is that while it's also a fighting game with a full set of fighting game moves and one-on-one -on -one fights, 
it is also a beat em up and an action platform. The basement we're in is the tutorial area and once we've completed that and have rid the castle of these evil dudes we can access a hop world and go rid other worlds of other evil dudes. This can be done either as Liu Kang or Kung Lao or as both together in a co-op mode. And later Sub-Zero and Scorpion can be unlocked as playable characters as well. I guess the game is also kind of an RPG because you don't have access to a full set of fighting game moves right from the get-go. And enemies drop XP that can be spent on unlocking set moves and there are also different colored coins that do something other RPG-like thing. As a smaller human I was a big Mortal Kombat fan. My first introduction was Mortal Kombat 4 on the PS1 at a friend's house when I was like 8. And then later my brother and I got Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance aka 5 as a gift for the original Xbox. And it's one of those few games where I can still hear the sound bites of different parts of the game just by looking at screenshots of it. You know, kind of like how people can look at a Duke Nukem poster and hear the Oh yeah, come get some. Yeah, I got that big time with this game. And I remember seeing Shaolin Monks back then and thinking that that was the coolest thing ever. But I was a teenager at the time, so at some point I must have traded the memory space of remembering to buy this game for a memory of a pair of tits. Yeah, that sounds like something teenage me would do. Or adult me. I know I say this a lot, but the game is really, really neat. Hot Sims, hot tubs, hot action. Brace yourself. The Sims are on PlayStation 2. Rated T for Teen. Challenge everything. Next up, we have a double feature starring The Sims and The Sims 2. Or rather, we have two game boxes with discs in them, but only one game capture from one of the games because The Sims 1 just wouldn't play. Which is weird because I tested this game specifically yesterday and it worked fine, but whatever. I guess that's just how PS2 games are. It's a shame because The Sims 1 is the one that I'm the most interested in revisiting for this video. Don't get me wrong, The Sims 2 is the far superior game, but I've played that one to absolute death with my brother back in the day. And we played it on the Xbox, so a lot less time was spent waiting for the game to load. And while The Sims 2 on consoles is its own beast, it does share a similar visual presentation with its big daddy PC counterpart. And The Sims 1? Not so much. And I would have liked to show off what I call The Sims 1.8, which is this version, but I guess today is not the day. But why are we even talking about The Sims on console? Surely the PC version with its 18 expansion packs and its PC-ness is the superior game. No, not really. Not that the console game is the superior one, it's just that The Sims 2 on consoles and The Sims games in general on console, up until the release of The Sims 3 on consoles, were their own beasts entirely. PC games feature freeform gameplay where you create a sim, pick a neighborhood, buy a house, move in, then make your own fun and set out on your own adventures. All done through the series signature queuing system where you the player move a cursor across screen and click on objects you want your sims to interact with and then wait for them to interact with said objects. Console games on the other hand usually feature a story mode or some sort of setup that determines what kind of character you are, like a young adult in an urban environment or the owner of a hotel. Aside from the GBA and Nintendo DS versions, gameplay is usually played through a 3D person perspective and features direct movement with the queuing sometimes being an alternate control method. But there's just something very simulation-y about directly controlling your sim and walking around and interacting with their homes and the other sims that inhabit those homes. The Sims 2 on the PS2 and Xbox specifically puts you the player, or players because it features split screen co-op, in the shoes of a young adult that has just moved into a roommate situation. You don't get to decide where you live but you do get to choose how you live and you can unlock multiple living situations and playable characters down the line. Each living situation or lots as they are referred to in game is its own separate self-contained mini adventure. The first two are basically tutorial areas. In the first one you help yourself out by fulfilling your golden wands and in the second one you assist Fair Moon Biscuit in her life goals to get a boyfriend and be good at painting or something. Anyways, where the game really shines is from Lot 3 and onwards. Lot 3 aka Cliffside Retreat is a bed and breakfast run by a couple who have fallen out of love. Next is Sunset Canyon where the player must help an old guy reconnect with his dead girlfriend who died 
along with the entire movie crew of the film she was working on in a big fire. And from there on out it just gets crazier and crazier. Like there is a lot that is a biodome under the sea where some rich people live. You can also live in a youth hostel or move in with an alien family whose house is an alien ship with a normal house protected on top of it as a hologram. Or you can move in with an alien family that lives in a normal house and you can help them be normal. The Sims 2 on consoles is really, really fun. And as an unimaginative teenager, it was good to play a Sims game that gave me directions so I didn't just set fire to the neighborhood cats or bang all the married women in town. Yeah, I was kind of a creepy weirdo for a tiny brief moment in time there. Next up is the Bouncer, which, like the two previous games, is also a product of that golden age where developers were free to explore other genres, and uh, that is the most positive thing I can say about the Bouncer, because uh, it's terrible. But you know me, if there is an absolute shit show, I want front row seats. And it is, like damn. This is the Shadow the Hedgehog of the Kingdom Hearts games. But Square's take on an Edgy Kingdom's heart character was to keep the clown shoes, give him a chain wallet because those are universally recognized as being badass, and then they made him a badass who beats people up as he still has a whiny voice, spiky hair, and a friend who has demon horn piercings and also a whiny voice. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible game. And maybe you're wondering why it's even on my favorite list. Well, Sometimes I find myself playing a game or enjoying a piece of media that was either made in the early 2000s or set in the early 2000s. And I think to myself, wow, this was a good time and it is a shame this time is gone. And now I'm old and that makes me sad. But then I pop in this game and I cringe so hard that it feels like my penis is trying to crawl back into my body. This game makes me feel Physically uncomfortable and I'm embarrassed on behalf of everyone that had a hand in its creation and everyone that has at any point in time, past, present or future, enjoyed this piece of virtual birth control. It's the perfect medicine for early 2000s nostalgia. There is an ongoing theme in this video selection that I didn't realize until now. Everything so far has basically been back when things were different but also better. Death by Degrees is no exception, it's like Shaolin monks, like literally the same concept. Death by Degrees stars Spank Bank material Nina Williams from the Tekken series in a high-stake, high-octane spy thriller beat-em-up game that was erased from series continuity around the same time as the quarterly earnings reports for the game came in at Namco that year. It's gratuitous, it's juvenile, it's all-around in bad taste, and it is the perfect poster child for what was wrong with how women were represented in media during that decade. And I can't take my eyes off it. Thankfully my disc is scratched to shit and only boots past the opening cinematic when it's having a good day. And just like The Sims 1, this was not a good day. So in the UK they had a magazine called something like PlayStation Magazine. And with it came demo discs that you could pop in your PlayStation system and try out demos that were included with that month's subscription. The US had an equivalent that was called something like PlayStation Underground, which also came with a disc, but according to the internet it wasn't as good as what the PlayStation Magazine offered. And then there was PlayStation World, the soulless pan-European abomination that I accidentally bought on a number of occasions thinking that it was PlayStation Magazine. PlayStation Magazine was translated and sold in Denmark and sometimes it wasn't translated and still sold in Denmark and sometimes it had another name. Magazines in Scandinavia, it's kind of a long and convoluted story. Anyways, unlike PlayStation Magazine or PlayStation Underground, PlayStation World didn't come with a demo disc. It came with a DVD that was just a bunch of trailers for all things PlayStation. 
The one I have here in my hands is PlayStation World 73, and by judging from the trailers it's from around 2006 or 2007. The odd thing about it is that it's from an era where three systems of PlayStation were still relevant. The PS2, the PSP and the PS3. There are a lot of trailers here, but I think the most interesting part of the disc is the Resident Evil 5 trailer, which shows a very different Resident Evil 5 and promises a release in 2007, which the game would miss with about two years. Partly because the demo that press played in 2006 was seen as kind of racist because it took place in an African shanty town and the zombies were fast because Africans run fast or something. I don't mind Capcom changing anything to accommodate a bunch of white journalists' perceived notion of what is racist and what isn't racist on behalf of people that are allegedly being racist and against. But I think it's a shame that we never got to see a Resident Evil that used daylight and sharp sun rays to in shadows to create a spooky atmosphere where enemies could be lurking in plain sight but disguised by the player's eyes having to adjust to the change in lighting. Or it could just have been a terrible idea that caused eye strain and that might be the actual reason that it was changed. Nah, it was probably just because the game was very racist. The other thing on the disc that caught my eye was the section dedicated to readers submitted sick tricks. And the sick trick I first stumbled upon was someone who submitted a clip of themselves failing to base jump off a building in San Andreas. And I think it really accurately represents how many fucks PlayStation World gave. Which would be zero. Last thing of any note was a trailer for a cancelled horror game where Clive Barker was involved. Demonic which looks by the trail like it's uh, fairly playable. Like it features a gameplay loop that mixes Hitman and the body hopping mechanic of that Jesus game Messiahs with a splash of Lucius. I've heard that there are demos and builds floating around out there, and I've seen some of the game on YouTube and it looks cool. And I've alerted Australian horror YouTuber Sunderland of its existence, so maybe we'll get a new episode in his excellent cancel horror game series about this game. And I think that's all there is to say about PlayStation World. I hope that's all there is to say about this publication that was definitely not a tax write-off for a larger media corporation, that they definitely didn't end up using to dump all their debt into and then close down. Totally not. Before we move on to the expensive stuff, I think we should go get some air. So join me on a leisurely drive through the hard sands desert and a hike from the Horn to the rescue station near Big Valley. 